Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel where we do talk all things true crime. If you are new here, hi, hello, and welcome. My name is Titanium Bill or Tanya, call me either or. And for my returning Titans, welcome back for yet another upload. I appreciate you guys watching each and every single one of my videos and joining me for my nightly lives. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into today's case coverage. I'm going to try to get to it as soon as I can because we do have um, somebody outside that's cutting down all the trees behind where we live right now. So if you hear a little bit of background noise, that's why. Um, but hopefully they're done because they've been out there since 8 o'clock this morning. And I am recording this at 430 in the afternoon and I can still actually hear him it sounds like he's gearing up to go back for around a hundred <laughs> so without further ado I'm gonna go ahead and get him right into Nancy Grace we are discussing the Idaho 4 case today I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the case that I'm talking about the four college students that were murdered out in Idaho um, out of Moscow Idaho so this is going to go over the search for um, the search on Brian Kohlberger's parents home that turned up an ID belonging to they're saying someone that lives in the Idaho that lived in the Idaho for home so they are, we're just wondering is it a victim's ID or is it just a regular old ID but it did say item 35 from the parents home search warrant it does state IDs inside of a glove inside of a box so Without further ado, I will go ahead and get Nancy playing for you. And as you guys are watching that, I will go ahead and pull up um, item number 35. That way you guys can see where it says it on the search warrant. Because there is a little confusion there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into this. <laughs> Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. Brian Koberger in the headlines again, as you will recall, Koberger charged in the murders of four beautiful University of Idaho students believed to have been asleep at the time of the attack. In the last hours, we learn that Koberger apparently kept a memento, a trophy of sorts, from one of his murder victims. What? We believe a student ID or driver's license was kept by Brian Koberger. Now, the ID has been identified as being found in either Koberger's car or Koberger's family home, put inside a glove in a box. Now, there has been much ado regarding was it found in the glove compartment in his car or in a box in a glove in his parents home either way it's a memento it's a trophy i'm actually looking it up right now i should have had this ready for you guys but i am going to pull it up um for you that way you guys can actually see it for yourself um Let's see if I can type right. Okay, so there's that one. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I have it. I'm going to share this with you here. It says, if you look under item 35, so it goes 33, 34, 35. It is hard to read. I do have it actually all printed out. If you want that, I can send it to you or you can always watch the live and get it because um, it's very hard to read the officer's handwriting. But number 35 does say ID cards inside glove inside box. This is for the family's home, so in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. Now, this one is going to be for the 2015 Hyundai Elantra that belonged to Brian Kohlberger. They found in this search warrant, and you're going to hear, you're, what you're not going to hear is, you're not going to hear anything about an ID or cards or anything of that nature. 
So it, it is from the parents' home, but the, for the search warrant. Um, but the search warrant for the car is Swab's Ziploc bag with zipper, pink zipper, 79 quarters, I'm sorry, seven quarters, plastic baggie with green zipper, 36 dimes, 32 nickels, eight pennies, gloves, receipts, car insurance card, car registration, hiking boots, comfort in, room key holder, and stay information, tire iron, shovel, goggles, floor mats, reflective vest, used water bottles, wrench, door panel, seats and seat cushions, headrest, seatbelt, visor, fiber, brake pedal, gas pedal, phone charger, band-aid, wrappers, maps, documents, and a seatbelt boot. So that's what they found in that search warrant. So it is going to be for, if it's any search warrant at all, it's going to be for the one from the parent's home. Jennifer Koffendoffer, the FBI agent that speaks on News Nation a lot of times, she's the one that put out that false information by accident, I believe. From the quadruple murders. Joining me right now, Cheryl McCollum, founder and director of the Cold Case Research Institute and star of a brand new hit series podcast, Zone 7. Cheryl, can you believe this guy? You know, Nancy, you and I talked early on about him having some type of trophy, some type of memento that he would keep. The fact that it's an ID tells me not only did he want it, he wanted it close to him. That's something you could carry in your wallet, something you could put in your visor of your car and look at it. I mean, it it's not big and it's, it's protected. So the fact that an ID would have some you know, type of you know, covering to keep it where you've spilled something, it would maintain its integrity. That just tells me what it meant to him. Cheryl McCollum, do you know, you know how I scrapbook, right? Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, I know. I completely took over my husband's closet. He's got room now <laughs> for like one shirt and one sock because the rest of the whole closet are stacks and stacks of um, scrapbooks. And they're mostly photo albums with mementos stuck in there. Right now, I got behind, okay? Uh, so I'm stuck on Christmas 2017. And it's all <laughs> over the den. Uh, <laughs> I haven't even made it up to Christmas Eve yet. But that said, I was looking at the day, the morning. It was a Saturday morning. And see, I'm doing it right now. I was putting together the segment in the scrapbook about when the... When the twins and I, and then David wandered in, decorated the Christmas tree. And I was remembering, because there was a picture of it, John David was playing the piano while we were decorating. And I made him stop and come over and help me decorate. The piano is right by the Christmas tree. And I was just remembering that. And we had Christmas music playing and... Uh, it's the, one of the closest things that have ever come to a Hallmark moment at Christmas time. <laughs> but that said, I couldn't help because this news came out as I'm working right in the middle of 2017 Christmas with the twins. And can't you just imagine Coburger with that ID? And you know it's one of the, the females. Um, Kelly, Gonzalez, Maddie, mm -hmm. Logan. I, I think one of them... Uh, of course, it could have been Xana, but I think, well, obviously it was one of the girls, so I'll leave it at that. How many times he looked at that idea? No Cheryl, question. what about this? Get this in your head. Remember, his father was driving the Elantra at one time during the trek mm -hmm. from Washington State University, over 2,000 miles to the parents' home in the Poconos for, I guess it was Christmas vacation. And he had that ID with him. Because whether it was found in the glove compartment of his Elantra or whether it was found in a glove, in a box, in his parents' home, he had to transport it. And how many times during that trip right. did he console himself, or worse, with that ID? It was a vital part of his post behavior. There's no doubt about that. And the fact that we know it was in the vehicle while his dad was there he probably took some that kind of twisted, you know, gratification in that as well. So if it was in the glove compartment, so to speak, the glove compartment was locked. So his dad couldn't maybe gain entry. And remember when they were stopped by law enforcement, not once, but twice, 
what if that ID was in his wallet at the time? Mm. Yeah, wallet is a good idea. Uh, the, ho- the whole reason people started thinking that this ID, and it could have been a student ID, it could have been a driver's license, it could have been a library card, it could have been any type of ID. It could have been a credit card without a picture on it. We don't know what it is yet, but um, a wallet would have been a good place to hide it. I think the idea of the glove compartment came from the fact that if you look at, I believe it's entry number 35 um, of the many, many lines in the search warrant return, it says ID found in a glove in a box. It mm-hmm. could have been a box of stuff he brought back from Washington State. It could have been a box that he hid, you know, in his parents' home. But just think about him going to the effort of putting it inside of a glove. I was saying earlier, it reminds me of people that still hide things in their underwear or their sock drawer, which I'm totally guilty mm-hmm. about. I still <laughs> have in there uh, locks of the twins' hair when they would get their first haircuts and more. And their teeth that the tooth fairy returned to me after she took them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In my underwear drawer. Like, that's not an obvious place to look. People hide jewelry and everything else in there. But just think about the act of him, let's just say, hiding the ID in a glove, in a Mm -hmm. box, transporting it across the country, and then having it at his parents' home. What about that? And knowing the whole time it was there. And it's all about power and control or over your victim or reliving the moment. Oh, it's definitely reliving. No question it's reliving. And the fact that it's in a glove, think about it. There was a glove left outside the scene. He might have worn gloves at one point. So the glove to me is a little twisted too. That's what you're going to put it in. I mean, you could put it in a smaller box than inside another box. He doesn't do that. He chooses a glove, which I think is critical. Um, And, you know, Nancy, you know, I've got an old cigar box. And it's one of those old wooden ones that's real pretty and all. And I have some stuff from when Walt and I were in high school. And to anybody else, it's junk, but not to me. So, again, anybody that might have stumbled upon this that didn't know what had occurred, the glove would be meaningless. And I don't know what else might have been in that box, but it might have just looked like like a junk drawer in your kitchen. Start your network in theaters. Are- Getting out of the... Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. You know, the other day, I was with Lucy. I forgot where we were, but... She um, had the wrapper off of a drinking straw and she sat there and turned it into a ring and put it on my ring finger. And we were getting out of the, we had dinner wherever we were. We were getting out and we, I always try to gather up all the, they trash the car. It's insane. It's constantly trash because of the twins. Anyway, I said, let's gather up all this trash when we get out. And she grabbed the little ring and said, here, throw this away. I'm like, are you kidding? I'm keeping this ring. And I put it on my finger. And guess what? I did keep it. <laughs> so it might look like junk to a lot of people, but it's something to us. But I'm just thinking about the planning it took for him to take that ID out of mm-hmm. the victim's home. And then leave with it. That's very risky behavior to keep an ID. And I made up a list of other killers that have kept things. All right, listen to this. Ed Gein, who was, I started to say insane, but he was not legally insane. Ed Gein made masks with his victims' faces. Okay, there's this other guy, Ivan Milat. He would stalk his victims at campsites then murder them, then bury them in the woods. But he would keep pieces of their camping equipment. I mean, Mm. just think, what if he used their camping equipment? Every time he would stir something in one of their pots and pans, he would remember that particular murder victim. Alex Mangle, wait for it, 
When police were doing their search, they thought they found a wig. It was not a wig. It was one of the victim's scalps. And he kept mm -hmm. it, and he actually wore it when he snatched his next victim. We've got John George Hay actually kept his victim's dog. Really? He kept the victim's dog? Every mm -hmm. time the dog would run to the door or come for a pet, he would think of his murder victim. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Robert Hansen kept victims' jewelry. John Christ Christie kept bodies in his kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. One killer, Stanley Dean Baker, kept his victims' bones, always the finger bones. What were you mm -hmm. saying? Dahmer. I mean, he kept uh, yeah. bodies and skulls. Yeah. And genitals. He oh, kept yeah. his victim's genitals. I guess the penis and the testicles. Harvey yeah. Glattman photographed his victims after they were dead. And uh, at one point, I think that they couldn't find one of the bodies, but they had the picture of the dead body. Dennis Rader, that's who I was thinking, kept copies of or the actual victim's driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. Much like what we're seeing right now. And we know there's some weird connection between Dahmer and BTK. Excuse me, between Koberger sure. and BTK, Dennis Rader. So That's what right. about the fact they may have copycat mementos? It would be, again, completely significant. And here's what it says to me. On your driver's license, I'm going to be able to remember not just your face, but an address. Um, other things about you that it's going to say on there, whether or not you're an organ donor, the color of your eyes, your weight, all of that is on there. So I'm capturing this moment in time forever. And again, I can keep it really close to me because it's small. When you're talking about masks and IDs and wigs and photographs, you're talking about a victim's face. It is critical to that killer they want to remember what you looked like, what they fantasized about. The other folks, when you're talking about equipment and dogs, that is something you touched. That's something that you love. That's something you took care of. And he took that from you. So he's re-victimizing you again on a different level. Now, we've also got Ted Bundy, who would keep victims' heads, and then he would mm -hmm. masturbate with the head. Now, that's something to pause and think about just for a moment there. Um, well, I can tell you all of these things that were kept were masturbated with, every one of them. You know, um, when I talk to you, as I've said before, I never know if I need a shrink or a drink. But since I'm a teetotaler, <laughs> I'll have to go with a shrink, you know, after. after <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but again, uh, when a, people a, say. A, a masturbation Koberger. tool, actually. Yes. When people say Koberger, it wasn't a sexual crime. I always tell people, you don't know that. Pre and post behavior matters. What he thought of that scene is what matters, not what the general public thinks. You know, another thing about him keeping a memento, and that is what, what it is. There's no reason for him to have one of these victims' IDs, none at all, except to relive the moment. Um, I wonder how he got it. Now, a lot of people believe Koberger had been in the home before the murders took place. I don't know if I agree with that. I'm thinking about him fumbling around in inside the home, the girl's home, and Ethan Chapin was also there that night. Did one of the victims have her ID laying out beside the bed? A lot of people do that. Did they have it on the kitchen counter so they could grab it in their car keys when they leave in the morning? You know, a lot of people do that. Did he just see it and grab it? Or did he fumble around in the dark looking for mementos and if he took that it makes me wonder did he take anything else like um some killers take the woman's underwear or mm -hmm. they take jewelry or a photo he could have other things that have not been identified yet as belonging to these victims cheryl he could have other things that haven't been located like Israel Keys, we don't know that he has a hidden thing somewhere in a cache in some bucket. We don't know. But what we do know is what he took, again, to me, is one of the most significant things you can take. Because if you take underwear, that's not her face. That's not where she went to school. That's not an address. That's something that only you would know. 
what he took, once it's located, everybody's going to know. This is hers. This isn't, oh, was this underwear belonging to A, B, or C? We may not know that, but this, we know. Another aspect of this, Cheryl McCollum, there's so, it's like a Rubik's Cube. You have to keep turning it and turning it and thinking about it. And this may never be part of the evidence at trial, but there's the additional psychological twist that he brings this memento of a quadruple murder and his fixation on at least one of these girls into his parents' home, right under their noses. They suspect nothing. They know nothing. They welcome him with open arms. And then right under their noses, he has a memento in their home of a quadruple mm -hmm. murder. And not just that. He went to their home after his car was identified. Like he knew they're getting close. They're looking at the car I drive. They are looking within eight miles of where I live for me. Now they put out a video. So now they're tracking my car quite possibly right back to my apartment complex. And not only did he keep it, he kept it in the same daggone car they're looking for and then transported it into mama's house. Like they're not going to be able to get a warrant for here. They're only going to be able to get a warrant for my apartment. Again, he doesn't understand how, you know, this thing really works. There were some mistakes that he made that clearly tell me, let me just say this. Everybody's asked me, do you think he's killed before? Don't you think there's other victims everywhere? I don't know how there's other victims everywhere when he made the mistakes he did with this one. He would have been caught before. I mean, he used his own car. He used his own cell phone. He didn't have enough sense to really shut the whole thing down. He used his apartment to hide crap. He used his mama's house to hide crap. I don't see this as a criminal genius that's gotten away. And he takes the memento. That's a huge blunder as far as I'm concerned. It's a huge blunder. And again, a pair of underwear, I couldn't put this belong to this victim for sure. But, a, but an ID, I can. Who's online, you know. Yes, we did our. Is potential cases. Police. It is April 14th. Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. Now, you mentioned potential other cases. Police are currently, we've been told, looking at two other cases in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Now, are they connected? Don't know. Uh, another thing that has come up, a very, very curious, is potential communications between, well, I can't say if it's between Koberger and one of the female victims, but by Koberger as far back as 2021. Was he fixated on one of these girls before he even started his PhD program at WSU, Washington State University? Another issue we are learning about is potential demolition of the crime scene, the home where the four students were murdered. It was set mm -hmm. to be demolished and then suddenly screeched to a halt. Cheryl McCollum, I do not think it should be demolished until after the trial and after the appell appellate courts confirm the affirm the conviction and that could be for 100%. a long time but 100 percent we just saw alex murdoch's jury taken to the dog kennels where we mm -hmm. know that maggie and paul were murdered we saw the oj simpson jury want to go see the home where oj simpson lived at the time i mean if denied that opportunity, if it becomes integral or critical at the trial to the defense, that could be a big problem. Well, we already saw it when they tried to move everything out and give everything back to the parents. The defense was like, wait a minute, we have the right to look at this too and examine everything. You and I are firm believers that the jury not only has the right to, but should visit a crime scene. I don't think anything should be kept from a jury. You are making the decision whether somebody is going to lose their freedom. You should have access to everything. Or their life. Correct. Um, one more issue. I think we the, the, the kibosh has been put on demolishing the house for now anyway. But that said, here is another monster that has reared its ugly head. 
the rumor of an internal affairs investigation on one of the cops. Don't know how involved they were in the Koberger case, but on some cop uh, involved, we don't know if it's a cop, if it's a man or a woman, if it's a detective, if it's a crime scene analyst, we don't know. But there is a report of an internal affairs investigation. You know what? That could skewer the whole thing. Look what happened in O.J. Simpson. Absolutely right. Do you know what the allegation is for the IA? I've heard rumors, but I'm not prepared to state it. Understood. Well, here's the deal. It doesn't matter. Um, it's going to be a black eye no matter what. And again, those things are, you know, they're made public and that can come in. The results of it can come in. Oh, um, yeah. It's yeah. called Brady versus Maryland. That went That's all right. the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And yep. it was determined that anything exculpatory, which means um, it exculpates or the defendant or shows that they may not be guilty, has to be handed over by the state if they know about it to the defense. And that could be anything from um, a witness saying, that's not the guy I saw at the scene. It could be a, a cop with an investigation going on, an internal affairs investigation. It could be anything that touches on the credibility of the state's case. Anything. So it Correct. has to be handed over. I mean, I would advise yes. the state, if there's a way to do it, not to put the cop up at all. No. I mean, no. what do we you think? We all remember that. You, you've got to tell the truth, and it should come from you first. It should not be anything that somebody gets blindsided with. You know, it's going to be really difficult for the defense to explain away any, any fantastical tale uh, they will come up with to explain why one of the victim's ID is with Koberger. Mm -hmm. How in the world can they explain that? Much less, Cheryl McCollum, when in combination with the totality of the evidence. And that's just the evidence that we know of right now. That's right. And they have more. We don't know how everything ties in from the apartment to Mama's house to his car. But it is a plethora of information and, and evidence. And you've got his DNA inside that room on a knife sheath. You've got that we know. We've got the phone pinging. We've got him having a traffic ticket in the same neighborhood. We've got the social media stuff that's going to come out. When the social media stuff comes out, it's going to blow your mind. This dude was obsessed with the third floor. And those two victims, in my opinion, are the target. The third floor has been the whole key to me from day one, including Again, the dog and the dog not being harmed. There's a ton of stuff that's going to make complete sense once it comes out. Just imagining Kay Berger in his efforts to clean up from the crime scene, coming back to his apartment covered uh, in blood, covered in fiber, possibly dog hairs. There's no way he can get away from dog hairs because that dog had been all over that house. And no matter where he went in the home, he came in contact with the dog hairs. Um, yep. The extremes he went to to clean up, but yet after all that planning and all that imagining and fantasizing about the murders, he still took a memento, one of the student IDs with him. Um, you know, how many times do you think he has relived it behind bars coulda woulda shoulda I, sh I can't believe I I left without the sheath I can't believe I turned my phone on you know halfway home from the crime scene all the things he did wrong that are now coming back to bite him in the neck every day he runs through it every day and it probably is destroying his ego uh to the point that he I mean he's not okay anyway but this certainly is going to be something that, you know, he battles every day. And you know what I tell people when they say, well, you know, is there such thing as a perfect crime? Have you ever heard of a wedding that took a year to plan that didn't have something go wrong? Just, and it may be a little thing. It may not be a big thing. It may not even be something your guests noticed, but you knew it. I don't know. Only, I planned mine in four days, and I thought it went perfectly. I know, and that's why the caveat was a year, because if you do something quick, 
there's not as much that can go wrong and you don't have the expectation. But if you plan for a year and you've got doves and rose petals and, you know, all that carrying on, something's going to happen. The cake's going to get knocked over. It's going to rain. One of your bridesmaids gets the flu. You forgot the ring. There's going to be something. I'm just telling you, the more you plan, the more that you're going to notice didn't go like you thought it was going to. And that's a happy thing. If you're planning a sinister, evil thing, there's a whole lot more that can go wrong. And this child, to me, does not look like he planned very well at all. I think he, he planned a lot, but he didn't do a good job of it. Now, what do you make what? of the fact that he may have been in contact or trying to contact or obsessed with in some way one of these girls as far back as 2021? Because, you know, search warrants were uh, right. delivered to Google, to Meta, you know, Insta, Facebook, Tinder, the local yeah. bank, and, um, of course, VZW and AT&T. They did a data dump from the cell phone tower of all the phones that had been used for about a half a mile around the hours surrounding the time of the murders. I mean, they have really gone on all out regarding forensic data as it relates to technical information like phone records, computer records. Yeah. They're even trying to match up, I believe, credit card and bank card transactions that may overlap with Coburgers. Were they at the same restaurant? Did he follow them there? Did he mm -hmm. watch them at the Mad Greek or wherever they were? There's going to be a yeah. lot more data, Cheryl McCollum. Oh, it's going to come out. I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind. Because this is what they also are going to know. It doesn't, it would not in any way surprise you and I um, how long he had been obsessed with them. Uh, I mean, that's something you and I talked about day two. That that's a great possibility because you're talking about a generation that lived their life in real time. All oh, this class up, 1020 in the morning. You know where she is at 1020 in the morning. You know they're having a party you know that their sorority is having a formal. You know where the formal is. They're posting pictures in 20 minutes. So these are not people that are hiding. His access to them was easy. He didn't even have to be a good stalker. They're making it easy. So again, it would not surprise me. And this is something that, you know, again, we said on your show repeatedly, they need to look at when he decided to go to school where he did for his PhD. Because you know he could have gotten in at DePaul. He had already gotten his master's there. Of course. But he didn't. Absolutely. And he already knew the instructors and he already had a close relationship. Or obsessed with in some way one of these girls as far back as 2021 because you know search warrants were uh, right. delivered to Google, to Meta, yeah. you know, Insta, Facebook, Tinder, yeah. the local yeah. bank and um, of course, VZW and AT&T, they did a data dump from the cell phone tower of all the phones that had been used for about a half a mile around the hours surrounding the time of the murders. I mean, they have really gone on all out regarding forensic data as it relates to technical information like phone records, computer records. Yeah. They're even trying to match up, I believe, credit card and bank card transactions that may overlap with Coburgers. Were they at the same restaurant? Did he follow them there? Did he mm -hmm. watch them at the Mad Greek or wherever they were? There's going to be a yeah. lot more data, Cheryl McCollum. Oh, it's going to come out. I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind because this is what they also are going to know. It doesn't, it would not in any way surprise you and I um, how long he had been obsessed with them. Uh, I mean, that's something you and I talked about day two. That that's a great possibility because you're talking about a generation that lived their life in real time. All oh, this class up, 1020 in the morning. You know where she is at 1020 in the morning. You know they're having a party. You know that their sorority is having a formal. You know where the formal is. They're posting pictures in 20 minutes. Okay, so that's all of the podcast there for today. Let me know your comment or let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Um, I believe the reason why they took the 
um, search warrants out and they, you know, retro them at back to 2021 was just basically because if they got six months back and they didn't find anything and then maybe on that seventh month, they're like, oh, there's something. We have to get another search warrant. So I think they just got a broad search warrant, you know, for the year, for the whole year, instead of just doing it for three months, six months, and then having to go back and get another warrant. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below though. If you guys haven't subscribed to the channel yet, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We're trying to make it to 10,000 Titans. That way we can get our Nancy Grace cardboard cutout. So big dreams over here on this channel. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you guys so much again for spending a little bit of your day with me and I will see you guys all in the next video. Bye guys.